again, I want to remind you what our basic definition of a derivative is. The derivative is the slope of a curve at a point. It's what we've been using. We've been using um, a limit definition of a derivative and came up with some shortcut rules for it. Um, we are going to talk about things with rates of change. And what that means is how is something changing in most cases compared to time? Um, so have some basic relationships. Um, if I have a position, we're going to call position function S of T. Um, position, we normally use the letter S. The velocity function, okay, we're going to, first thing I'm going to do is we're going to say that the average velocity E, e, I'm going to put AVG, is going to be um, the change of my S, change of position, divided by the change of time. Okay, and those are going to be fixed points. Okay. Um, from any point, um, we're going to go from the points um, A, comma, F of A. To the point a plus delta t, whatever my change of time was, to f of a plus delta t. My average velocity function would be the change of my y values, which is f of a plus delta t minus f of a. over a plus delta t minus a, which is just my delta t. And again, that's the change in s over the change of t. That's my average velocity. We have already been doing that. We've already covered that. The instantaneous velocity, that's when I get into the calculus. Okay. The instantaneous velocity is the limit of the average velocity as delta t goes to zero. So my v instantaneous is equal to the limit as delta t approaches zero of f of a plus delta t minus f of a all over delta t. That is the exact same thing that we used as our definition, except we did x plus h minus f of x all over h. It's the same form. Anytime you have a limit that's in that form, which means I can, this is telling me that the instantaneous velocity is equal to the derivative of my position function. Okay? So, uh, so that's how we get that. So what we're going to go even further than velocity. We're going to come up with the table that's on, I believe, your page 173. Again, we're going to say position function is some function of time. That means my velocity function is the derivative of position with respect to time. Or I could write it as f prime of t. My acceleration function is the derivative of my velocity function with respect to time, which is the second derivative of my position function with respect to time twice. Or another way to write it is as f double prime of t. So my position function, the derivative of that is the velocity. The derivative of velocity gives me the acceleration function. And I'm going to do one example of the one that's directly with positions. 
Um, and then we're going to talk about other models that don't necessarily use position functions. In them. So I'm doing example number three out of the book. And example number three says the pose of stone is thrown vertically upward with an initial velocity. So example three. Says I'm throwing a stone upward with an initial velocity of 64 feet per second. From an initial height of 96 feet. Says by Newton's laws of motion, the position of the stone after any given time can be given by an equation. Um, you should be able to come up with this equation on your own, but they give it to you in the book. This is S of t is equal to negative 16 t e squared plus initial velocity times time plus initial height. So again, this is negative 16 t squared plus initial velocity times time plus initial height. This is if we're in feet per second, feet and seconds, or it's negative 4.9 t squared plus initial velocity times time plus height if we're in meters and seconds. That's from last year in college algebra. So now let's ask the questions, answer the questions it has. Um, it says find the velocity and acceleration functions. So A says find velocity. So velocity is equal to, well, velocity at any given time is equal to S prime of T. And this is a power rule problem. I'm just going to take the derivative, multiply by the exponent, negative 32, E squared. Uh, no, negative 32 T because I subtract one from the exponent plus 64, and the derivative of 96 is zero, because that's a constant. My acceleration function, a sub t, is equal to the derivative of my velocity function. I'm just going to take the derivative of this, which is negative 32. Okay. The units of my velocity function are going to be the units of my position function, which is height, divided by time. So this is feet per second. The units of my acceleration function is the units of my velocity function divided by time, which is in seconds. So this would be units of feet per second squared. And you should recognize the negative 32 feet per second squared as the gravitational constant on Earth. That's where why that equation works. B, what is the highest point above the river reached by the stone? I could have asked you that question last year. And last year, you would have used the original function and told me what time the vertex happened. And we would have used negative B over 2A. But just think about this. The velocity of the highest point. So let's think about this. I'm throwing the stone up. And then it's going down. Okay. The velocity at the highest point is the derivative of this curve, which is the tangent to the curve at the highest point. What is the slope here? Zero, which means I want to find out when is my velocity equal to zero. So here, I'm going to set zero is equal to negative 32t plus 64. Solve for t, going to subtract 64. I'm going to divide by negative 32 and get t equals 2 seconds. With what velocity will the stone strike the river? Well, here I have to go back and use some algebra. So velocity at h equals 0. Well, I now need to figure out when is it going to hit the river. Um, well, I have to go back to my original function, and I need to find its x-intercept that's over here. So here's time zero. I need to find out this x-intercept that's going to give me some time 
I'm going to put that time into my velocity equation, and that'll tell me the velocity at that given time. So I'm going to do a little bit of cheating here. It's not really cheating. I'm going to rewrite this. I want to know when 0 is equal to negative 16t squared plus 64t plus 96. You could always use the quadratic formula for that, but I recognize that every single one of those numbers is divisible by 16, and they're actually divisible by negative 16. I'm going to divide everything by negative 16 and get the following. 0 equals t squared. 64 divided by negative 16 is negative 4. t. 96 divided by negative 16 is negative 6. I'm now going to factor. I'm going to get t, uh, two numbers that multiply to negative 6 that add to negative 4. I don't have them, so I can't factor it. But let me go 64 divided by 16. I want to verify that's 4. It is. I cannot factor it. So I'm going to use the quadratic formula from here to get my answer. So I know that x equals negative b, which is 4. Normally, I would do the plus or minus. But notice over here, that x intercepts negative time. We're not going to use that one. So I'm only going to use the plus. The square root of b squared, which is 16, minus 4ac, which would be plus 24, all over 2a, which is 2, which gives me 4 plus root 40, all over 2. Now, on a test, be careful that root 40 is 2 root, two, uh, two root 10. I have 4 plus 2 square root of 10 over 2 which is 2 plus the root 10. And my uh, that's the t. Um, be careful. I'm not going to put it into a calculator yet. Um, I don't want to round too early, and this may actually be on a question where it says, hey, don't use your calculator, and that would be the time that I'm going to stick into this velocity function to figure out what its velocity is. So that's what I'm going to do. My S prime is equal to negative 32 times time, which is 2 plus square root of 10, plus 64. Um, negative 32 plus 2 is ne uh, negative 32 times 2 is negative 64. Negative 64 plus 64 is 0. And that's going to give me the square root of 10, and it, I'm in feet per second. And if we actually wanted to get an approximate answer, so I'm going to do the square root of 10. That's approximately 3.16 feet per second. The time here, that's approximately 5.16. Okay, so that's how I would do that. And here's something. Anytime you're doing that vertical motion model, your acceleration is constant. So no matter from the time you started throwing that thing up in the air, its acceleration was due to gravity, and it's always at that negative 32 feet per second squared. So that's dealing with the derivative as rate of change of position. Um, the other parts that they have in your book are about generic growth models, which is any, so we're going to say, we're just going to write it. I'm going to write growth model on here. And a growth model, we're going to say P is some function of time where measures our quantity of interest. Okay. Um, so the rate of growth is the 
change of P with respect to time. Okay, so that would actually be the average rate of growth, our instantaneous rate of growth. is the derivative of p with respect to time. We could write that as p, um, our, and we would write that as, yeah, there we go, dp over dt, um, which would be p prime of p. So it's basically the same thing that you're using um, with just any equation, not just a position equation. But we're basically going to use the exact same thing we did before. The, the rate of growth is the instantaneous. Average is just the, the changes. And the instantaneous gives us our, we use the derivative to find it. Where it's slightly different is in economics. There's two things we want to talk about in economics. The first one is the average cost. Okay, um, and the average cost, we're going to have some C of X to produce X items. Um, so if C of X is the cost, so average cost is going to be C of X over X, where C of X equals the dollars to produce X items. So there's my average cost. I'm going to take the total cost divided by the number of items I did. And that C of X function usually has some sort of fixed cost plus a variable cost. times the number of items. So your cost function um, a lot of times is linear, okay? Then we have something that is called marginal cost. And that is the cost to produce one more item. And the way that we get the um, marginal cost, marginal cost, we put a, um, actually, marginal average cost, they're going to use C bar of X is the average cost. The marginal cost is C prime of X. So that's going to be the approximate cost to produce one more item after producing X items. So I know it's, you know, it's messy just in words, um, but I'm going to do the example that's in the book. And that is example five. They give me a cost function of negative 0 0.02 x squared plus 50x plus 100 for 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 1,000. First thing they want me to do is they want me to find the average cost. They want me to find C bar of X. Okay. That is just my original function divided by X. So that's going to give me negative 0.02 X plus 50 plus 100 over X. I can just look at it and divide each term by X. The Marginal cost is the derivative of my original function. Multiply by the exponent, negative 0 0.04, fract one from the exponent, plus 50. 
Determine the, average, determine the average and marginal cost for the first 100 items and interpret these values. So I want to do x equals 100. I'm going to do it for both of them. So my average cost of 100 items is equal to negative 0 0.02 times 100 plus 50 plus 100 over 100. That would be negative 2 plus 50 is 48. 48 plus 1 is 49. So the average cost to make 100 items is $49. Now, I am going to do the marginal cost of 100 at negative 0 0.04 times 100 plus 50, which gives me four plus, negative 4 plus 50, which is 46. My words for this one is after producing. 100 items, the next item, which is the 101st, will cost $46 to make. I'm not going to do the part C, which says determine the average and marginal cost for the first 900 items. I'm just going to put, put 900 into both of those equations um, and get the answers. I just wanted to do this so you guys can kind of see the work that went with average and marginal cost. And the last thing that we want to talk about is elasticity um, in economics. This will help you when you take economics later this year. You won't be doing any calculus with it, but the definitions can kind of help around with you. Um, it describes changes of input related to changes of output. Changes of input related to changes in output. Um, because the word change is in there, that means that we can do derivatives of things. Typically what they're talking about is, let's talk about gas. If gas price changes from $3 to $4, the amount of gas somebody's going to buy is probably going to go down. People are going to start to maybe drive a little bit less. Um, but they still have to drive to and from work, so the amount of, they still have to buy a certain amount of gas, but maybe some of those side trips are going to go away. So if we have any demand function, so if, if D is the demand function. With price. Such that D is some function of the cost. The price elasticity. is the derivative of the demand function times the price divided by demand. So this is the, this is um, derivative of demand 
times price divided by demand. So what that gives us, it says like, hey, a 2% increase of price is going to give us this amount of increase or decrease in demand. Um, so let's kind of look at what I have assigned for your work for this section. And I assigned you 10, 12, 18, 42, and 44. I'm just going to look those over really quick. We have a graph of a position function. We have an equation of a position function. We have a vertical motion model, 20. Um, they want to find, you're going to be using a graph to come up with um, growth rates at particular times. So that's derivative. So it's the slope that you're going to be using. They give you the equation. And problem 30 is a position function with a different constant due to gravity. Um, I'm going to try to get the textbook in here. Oops, sorry about that. Oh, I'm not going to be able to get the textbook in there. I'm just going to try to, um, I'm going to walk through problem nine. I'm not going to do the actual problem. I'm just going to talk you through nine which is kind of like your 10. nine you have a graph that looks something like this and they're asking us some questions about it. it says determine the average velocity of the car during the first 45 minutes of the trip so um anytime you're doing average velocity you are just calculate the slope of the secant line. So 45 minutes of a trip was like three quarters of an hour. So it's somewhere here. So what I want to do is I would want to calculate the slope using change in Y over change in X from reading it off the graph. So it would be 30 divided by 0.75 and I would get my answer there. Part B, it says find the average velocity over the interval from 0.25 to 0.75. Well, 0.25 to 0.75 would be 